Dans les skis, 3, 2, 1, stop! Pour moi, je suis prêt à démarrer les moteurs. Tu vas démarrer en allant dire pour les moteurs. Alors pour le 1, c'est ok pour le 1. Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to the We Make It Fly Airbus podcast. In this series, we're focusing on all that matters in space, defense, and security. My name is Martin Aguera. I'm a member of the Airbus communications team, and I'm thrilled to welcome a very special guest for today's program. Today, it's all about space, and our guest has been to space twice. In 2009, he was part of a mission that lasted over 10 days, and among others, got him two spacewalks. In 2017, he went up for the second time and he spent a total of 139 days in space and while there served also as the commander of the International Space Station. Our guest joined the U.S. Marine Corps in 1989 and is a fighter pilot by trade. During his career, he logged more than 6,000 flying hours in a total of 83 types of aircraft, primarily the F-18. It's a great honor to welcome retired Colonel Randy Bresnik to the program, who currently serves NASA as an active astronaut. Randy also goes by the call sign Comrade. Comrade, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martin. It's a pleasure to see you again and have a chance to talk to you and, and talk to the folks over there in Europe that are part of our international partnership and in going into space. Absolutely. We're thrilled. Comrade, I just captured uh, some of the milestones of your distinguished career. I hope I got it correctly. But uh, these are only a few of a very long list. For those that don't know you yet, um, can you maybe share us a little bit of your personal background? Well, you, you say uh, distinguished. I say fortunate. I you know, grew up in a, a lower middle class family. Um, you know, both my parents worked. Uh, neither one of them had you know got have a university degree. But my dad, my father was a you know police officer. My mother was a nurse, um, and we had four kids. And you know, I was fortunate to be able to get a scholarship for them. Marine Corps to be able to go to college, and that allowed me to get my university degree in, in mathematics uh, with a minor in political science and become a Marine Corps officer, which allowed me to go to flight school. And that, that was my goal. I, I just wanted to fly. And fortunately, I did uh, well enough in flight school that I was able to be selected to fly F-18s. Back then, they were still relatively new. And, uh, you know, I just had an amazing opportunity to be able to go fly F-18s. You know, I was got qualified in the F-18, and six months later, you know, I was uh, overseas in uh, stations in Japan in Iwakuni on a deployment already uh, as a shirt for you know North Korea and you know came home and was home for a year and did another deployment to Japan and then came home for a year and was over in Japan another time for uh, this time for one year so throughout my first initial fleet tour I got an opportunity to fly the F-18 all over the world opportunity to go to Top Gun and our weapons school to become a training officer be able to you know know the latest tactics and train the guys in the squadron and, and after that you know it was like okay well what, what's next after you've you know had that opportunity to excel in that platform it was you know if I, hey reach a little high Hey, can I apply to test pilot school? And uh, was, was eventually selected to go to test pilot school. And, you know, walking in the door of a school where they got plaques of all the, the previous classes and see names like Alan Shepard and John Glenn and Gene Cernan and, uh, you know, all these icons of, of aviation and, and uh, space flight. Going, wow, I, I think I'm probably, you know, outclassed here. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it, but end up surviving. You know, we say it's uh, two years of education slammed into one at test pilot school because you're doing classroom stuff as well as writing, you know, uh, technical papers, learning to bridge the gap between engineering and the operational community. And then test pilots provide that, that link as well as the whole time you're flying and you're gathering the data that is actually necessary to be able to write these reports and be able to translate programmatic speak and operational requirements into actually something that uh, pilots can use. You said all you want to do is fly. Was that a desire that was in you as as already a child or when did it actually start that you wanted to become you know a part of the aerospace community uh, and and fly fighter aircraft i was always just fascinated with, with flight uh, my father had, uh, was a pilot he encouraged me but he he didn't drive me towards it you know certainly you know anything that you know he wanted me to excel at whatever i was interested in but we happened to live in santa monica underneath the traffic pattern of santa monica airport uh, and so i whenever i heard a plane i'm always looking up you know and, and i'm reminded of the old saying we have here you know where, where we talk about a uh, boy young boy and his father who go to an air show and uh, you know they're watching the planes go overhead and the, the boy pulls on his father's arm and says daddy daddy when I grow up, I want to be a pilot. And the dad looks down at the son and says, I'm sorry, son, you can't do both. And so it's just always fascinated me. And then, you know, as I became learn more about him and then, you know, saw what fighter airplanes can do, you know, I was just like, wow, that looks 
amazing. And, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I was just a, a skinny kid from Southern California. You know, I didn't know anything about that. I was just, like I said, the fortunate opportunity that I was selected for a Marine Corps scholarship that allowed me the opportunity to go to flight school because I couldn't have afforded to do it on my own. Um, and so just every step away and the more I learned, the more fascinating it became. You know, how do these things work? Why do they work? Why are they so different between the Air Force planes and the Marine Corps planes and the Navy planes? Why are the ones you know, made by um, the companies in Europe, uh, Dassault, Airbus, you know, uh, and all the other ones, you know, the Eurofighter Typhoon, why do they look the way they do? And so that's what got me started. And then certainly that's what piqued my interest in going to become a test pilot, you know, um, being able to take something that's an idea and turn it into something that's operationally useful and something that flies. Uh, as we say in test pilot school, when we're learning aerodynamics, being able to go out and rub airplanes and be able to look at an airplane and go, wow, that, that plane has some directional stability issues because it has this big fin underneath or, you know, it has two tails, you know, well, why are they like that? You know, take the tornado, for example, with the big one huge tail, but you get the same directional stability out of the F-18 or F-15 that has two tails that are smaller. I love that stuff. And then certainly once I became an astronaut, I got a chance to travel to Russia and seeing the Monino uh, Museum there, planes that I never even knew existed and all the interesting aerodynamics that the, the Russians figured out on, you know, with their programs, absolutely just fascinating to just, you know, spend days and days and days looking at these things. Right. And after flying 83 different types of aircraft, you decided, well, that's still not enough. I got to do more. What sparked your desire to become an astronaut? And, um, you know, how did you accomplish that goal? I mean, for everybody that is probably listening to this program, it seems, sounds like that must be a huge challenge, isn't it? It, it is. And and, you know, I was certainly captivated by what had gone on, you know, in space programs uh, my whole life. You know, even as a kid, I remember building models. You know, I had one model of Ed White's first American EVA where he's out in his spacesuit on the umbilical out out of the Gemini capsule. It was one of the models I built. It had a uh, Apollo lunar module. And certainly growing up in school when the space shuttle program was was starting off in, in high school and, and college. And it was just fascinating to me. But again, I was just, you know, a skinny kid, you know, from Southern California. It wasn't something I ever thought was possible. I just thought it was, you know, absolutely fascinating. And, you know, one of the things you, you dream about. But as I became a Marine Corps pilot and then, you know, began to flying fighters and then opportunity to go to test pilot school, it's like every step of the way allowed me to be more qualified. But even when once I had you know, become a test pilot, did fly, test flight on the Super Hornet as it was coming out, um, went back to test pilot school and became an instructor. I still you know, looked at the people that were applying uh, as well. There's no way that I'm qualified or enough for it to be considered. And But, you know, you apply anyway and you see what happens. And it turns out that, you know, for all the people that we select, none of us ever know why why it was us. Because there's 10 other people as qualified or more qualified. There's just, there's just something they saw in you, which is why we have not only the, the paper application, but we also have the interviews and you spend time here to see if it's not only an intellectual, but it's also a, you know, compatibility with other people, you know, because they kind of look at it, scratch their heads when you're down here for the interview going, is this someone I really want to be stuck in a tin can for, you know, say six months with, and, and they have good interpersonal skills and soft skills, as we say. So that's, that's one of the additional factors, but to, to be selected was just, you know, such an amazing, I, I was just, when I got actually interviewed, I thought that was, that was the pinnacle, you know, okay, they, I'm honored enough to be, to be interviewed as good as it gets. And then so to be selected was a complete surprise. And I've been just you know, scratching myself every day, you know, thankful that I've had that opportunity. Right. And and here we are. Uh, you've been to space twice, once for a, you know, rather short period of time. The other one for around six months, I guess. Can you give us an idea? How do you prepare for such a mission? I mean, either whether it's long or short, I guess it's the same challenge. You're going up there uh, in a space shuttle. You got to, like you said, you got to be up there in the on the ISS and the International Space Station. How do you get prepared for that? You know, fortunately, by the time I got a chance to fly an SCS-129, it was the, you know, 129th space shuttle. So we, we had a really good training program. So they, they were able to teach us all the different systems within the space shuttle. And it takes a, you know, on the shuttle flight deck, we had four people, you know, the commander, the pilot, uh, mission specialist number two, which is kind of sat in between the, the pilot commander is kind of like a flight engineer, like you would on one of the larger aircraft. And then we had MS-1 over on the right side behind the pilot that uh, was able to take care of uh, other systems as well. And within that cockpit, if you've ever seen a picture, over 1,100 switches, display buttons, circuit breakers that we had to learn. And, and I mean, amazing. And everybody had their own set of switches they were responsible for. But it got to the point because of the way that we trained and the methodologies we used that, you know, literally I could just I had a whole bank of uh, I, I went as an MS2. And so I was the essentially the flight engineer with circuit breakers and switches above my head, you know, spanned the whole top of it. I knew I could, you know, something went wrong. I had to do something. I could just reach up and I, you know, then look and my hand was you know, right there. You just you learn all this stuff uh, by the good training methods. For the shuttle flight is about 11 months of training uh, to prepare for it. Um, 
you mentioned that on that first space flight, I you know ended up getting two spacewalks. Well, the other part is I also had um, our, our daughter born uh, in the middle of those two spacewalks, and so that was that was the bigger thing going on. So while I was training for the space flight, the you know the pinnacle of my aviation career, my wife was pregnant with our with our daughter, um, and we had just adopted our son a few months before that. So here we are learning to be parents, expecting another child, all in the whole same time. I'm, I'm working on training for my first space flight. And so that was a you know, real good um, lesson, life lesson on being able to prioritize, build compartmentalize and just kind of keep things in perspective that, yeah, space flight, it, it's still, you know, the pinnacle of my aviation career, but it's still just a job. And, uh, you know, the space flight is over, but now I've got a 14 year old son and a 10 year old daughter. And, you know, every day with them is, is special. And so we, we rush right up to the, the launch, the launch moves, the delivery date of our daughter moves such that we end up launching while my wife's, you know, nine and a half months pregnant. And, um, you know, have our daughter delivered in the days between my two spacewalks. And, uh, you know, it, that whole time, you know, you, you're going to space, you can see all the movies you want, talk to all the people that have been there, you know, train as much as you want. But until you're there, it's just such a overwhelming sensory overload and mentally mind blowing experience to see the curvature of the earth go from this your whole life to, to this, that uh, it, it just you can pre- you can prepare all you want, but until you experience it, it, it just really um, can't be described a- accurately. Uh, and so the preparation is is all great, but uh, you have to rely on your training to once you have this overwhelming sensory experience to be able to execute your training just as you did it, so you can get past the, the physical sensations, the the mental um, enormity of it when you go around the Earth in ninety minutes. You sit there, and go, wow! I just flew from you know U.S. to Europe. It took me about seven hours. That was a long trip, and and think about around the whole planet in 90 minutes. It just, it, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to it. But, you know, compartmentalize, you get used to it. And amazingly, the body adapts quickly. Your training takes over. And by the, you know, second, third day, you're acting like you've been there for quite a while. Compare that to the space station mission of the, you know, mine was, you know, five months. Shuttle, you knew every minute of every day. But when you launched, that's when the clock started and it was a sprint the whole way through. Space Station, it's a it's a marathon. And you get up there and there are times when it's busy, but you know, typically we try and get weekends off to recharge and reset yourself and get some time to decompress from the from the busy weeks that you have. But you have to be able to surge at any moment, um, be able to you know harbor and uh, build up your, your internal batteries when you need to, uh, to be able to do a long duration because sometimes we have folks that are planning to be up there six months and they end up doing seven or eight. And so you, you never I would have a question on the International Space Station. I always thought, you know, it must be extremely small, narrow, but I recently read an article that kind of suggested that the ISS is actually as wide as a football field. Is that correct? I mean, what is it like to be there? Is it crowded? Is it wide? Is it a good place to be? I mean, so the uh, outside, so you got the, the big, huge truss with the, with the solar rays on each side. And then along the center, you have the habitable volumes of the Russian segment and the U.S. segment. And then on the very front end, you know, off of uh, Node 2, on the right side, you have the Columbus European module. On the left side, you have the Japanese module. The outside, they say, is about the size of a football field. And that's what we crawl around on when we're doing the spacewalks to be able to do repairs or upgrades or anything like that. You know, like the spacewalk is going on right now, you know, the fourth one they've had here in the last couple of weeks to uh, finish up the batteries and some other external um, uh, tasks. The interior volume between all the different modules is about the same as a five bedroom house. So it's really a lot of volume. I think like uh, 690 or 680 cubic meters of space. So it's, it's quite a bit. And with, you know, typically we have a crew of six up there at full complement. And so it's really not that crowded because if we have two or three Russian crew members down the Russian segment during normal daylight hours, and then three to four U.S. crew members on the uh, U.S. OS, which is the U.S. Um, operating side. So that includes our European partners, our Canadian partners, Japanese, and all that. And so you could be working in different areas and, and doing stuff and, and go hours without seeing another crew member. And it's such a big volume on the inside. You know, you can look at the videos uh, on any of our, you know, social media pages that show how you, you, you float by. And so the volume we have on, on Earth when you're standing on the on the ground seems pretty big when you're in space because you can just float by over top or beside to me qualitatively it kind of seemed like the volume was twice as big as it, it felt on earth because you could use all the space and, and float above in the corners and things like that so it's really really quite large you know, back to the memory mentioned how my daughter was born in between my spacewalks on my first flight well i was actually sleeping in columbus while we were docked to the space station during that mission and so there my wife's an attorney for nasa doing international law works with our, our you know our esa partners all the time but there's there there are some countries the law is is that your child's nationality is the location of where the father is when the child 
is born, not the location of the child. So there's some people going, well, does that mean that your daughter is actually European? Um, but then somebody extrapolated further and go, well, you're actually up in space. So does that make your daughter an alien? <laughs> awesome. I mean, that's a, that's a great story. It must have been really uh an amazing, amazing experience and memory you probably cherish. Tell us, how does a typical day routine on the ISS look like? I mean, you guys wake up and what do you guys do? The days are very busy. We have a certain amount of prescribed sleep time. We get up, we have a uh, post-sleep time where we have a chance to, you know, brush your teeth, shave, clean up, get dressed, uh, eat breakfast. And then we have a, a morning conference called the, the Daily Planning Conference. And that's when we get on the radio with all the control centers in the world. Houston, Scuba, in Japan, we get on with uh, Oberfaffenhafen, you know, Get on with them and call them Munich, and then uh, we also get on with uh, Russia at, uh, in Moscow, and we have go through all the different control centers about any changes or uh, to the day or to the schedule or any questions we have, and then we start working. And each crew member has their own schedule, and we have a uh, you know a red bar that moves along that schedule all day long, keeping track of where you're supposed to be, uh, and we keep track of you know what you've completed. You know we have the uh, systems for the, the calendar to keep us up to date to what what the task are, um, have all the, you know, uh, procedure items, the links to the pictures, um, it has any notes that have been upgraded by the, the people doing that particular part, whether it's a maintenance task or a science task or a, uh, a, a check out of a physical activity, like a, a stress test. Um, and so those are all in the day and we go about our work. Sometimes you work with another crew member. Sometimes you're working by yourself. I said, sometimes it's science, sometimes it's plumbing, sometimes it's maintenance, sometimes it's, uh, you know, recycling urine. Uh, and then throughout the day, we usually have about two and a half hours of exercise plan where we have about an hour of cardio, either on the treadmill or, or the cycle, or, and then an hour and a half of actually we call weightlifting uh, on the A-RED, uh, the assistive resistive exercise device. And because there's no weight in space, we were actually pressed against a platform with our, with our legs or a body and we have pneumatic cylinders actually allow us to dial in the weight that we actually react against that makes us feel like if you're in a weight room here on earth. And that's an amazing piece of machinery that allowed me to come back stronger physically stronger because we, we measure before and after than, I, than before I left uh, because I don't usually get two and a half hours to work out every day here on earth, unfortunately. Right. Sounds like a lot of time. You did two spacewalks. How does it feel like? What were the first things that went through your mind as you got out there in your spacesuit and you're floating around in space? Something like, oh my God, don't let this rope uh, cut loose. Or I mean, what's the sensation about being out there? The airlock on the space station, the hatch opens up to the bottom. So it opens up to Earth. So, you, so you're inside the airlock. You come out in your spacesuit, and you get ready to come out that hatch. And you have to you know, dive down, you know, out the uh, out the hatch. Below you, there's nothing but 400 kilometers of nothing. And so you can imagine the natural physical reaction is, <laughs> if I let go, I'm going to fall. I mean, no different than if you went to the top of a, of, a, of a you know two, three, and higher story building, stood on the very edge of it with your toes, and started to lean over. That you know, that, everybody knows that sensation that you would start to feel if that happened. Your body telling you, "Back up, back up. This doesn't feel good." Well, multiply that times about you know ten thousand, um, and that's the the natural feeling. It doesn't matter, you know, if it was my first spacewalk on SCS one twenty nine or my fifth one. You know, uh, we were on space station. It is the same sensation because your your whole life has has taught you that. Whether it's the cliff of some you know um, gorge or, or uh, that you or bridge that you're on or some building, you know everything in your life has said if if I go over there that's I'm going to fall. And so you have to you know allow your body to relax, to allow you the training to go. Okay, here's how I get out. Here's how I practiced it in the neutral buoyancy lab or the big swimming pool where we have the uh, space station. I come out. I put my hand here. I put my hand here. I rotate my body this way. I put my tether on this handrail. I put my other tether on that handrail. And I know that I'm not going to fall and your body starts calming down. And then, you know, the other part is, is that when you look down that 400 kilometers, you're moving at 25,000 kilometers per hour. So that was at 10 kilometers per second. And so you, you see this thing rotating underneath you and it's really actually kind of beautiful. And you really want to just kind of spend the whole time looking at it, but you actually, you know, they hire you to go out there and do some work. And so you, uh, and we're going to execute your tasks, but every once in a while you're able to to get a glimpse down and take a look and uh, you know, really admire at the beauty of the planet, but really having to focus because every hand movement you make is is required. It, if you let go, we have a, a safety tether that keeps you on the space station, but you don't ever want to end up in that situation where you have to use it. And so, you know, the other thing when you have to for space ops, when the sun goes down, you've got the lights on the side of your helmet and it's like being in the caves. And all, you have to look around to be able to see stuff um, because we don't have a, a whole lot of lights on the outside of the space station. And so even though the, you know, uh, the stars 
stars are out because you have some light and you really don't see them all that well when you're actually out there uh, doing the spacewalk. And so it's it's really, really dark. Uh, and so that's where you're training on, okay, I'm turning this way. I'm expecting to see this piece over here. I'm, I know that I've trained to translate on this particular path. Uh, and you look in the right direction with the lights and eventually you know, it becomes very, very normal. And but still that first feeling of going out. And one thing I'll say is, is if uh, folks want to go to at Astro Comrade with a K, um, there's the video. I actually had GoPros on my on my three EVAs from the space station back in 2017. And you can see a video of what it's like to, that GoPro coming over the hatch and then going outside. And you can get a little bit of that feeling of what it's like. All right, folks, there you go. Follow Astro Comrade on Twitter and all the social media platforms. Comrade, you've been actively involved in the preparations for the Artemis mission, which is uh, supposed to bring humans back to the moon in a few years down the road. Just a few days ago, we've had the 51st anniversary of the original moon landing, Neil Armstrong being the first one to set foot on the moon. Would you be up for that mission in a few years down the road or after two space missions, you would say, hey, I've had enough? I think it's safe to say that every astronaut wearing a blue fight suit, whether it's your side of the pond or mine, <laughs> and in fact, majority of the ones that are retired astronauts would be happy to go do that. So there is no lack of interest in doing that anywhere. And, and, and certainly people who are not in blue flight suits, you know, and there's a whole generation of future astronauts, whether it be uh, Europe, Russia, you know, Japan, China, you know, and the U.S., uh, anywhere that uh, would look forward to that as well. And hopefully that's the work that we're doing together to be able to get to that point where spaceflight becomes normal, where low Earth orbit becomes as normal as, as hopping on an airplane and flying from, you know, Bremen to Houston. And, and so the moon stuff would a little bit further out, but wouldn't it be great instead of going to Euro Disney, you guys, you could ask your kids, go, hey, kids, you know, we, we got uh, you know, 50,000 euros to spend on vacation. We're going to go to Euro Disney or we're going to go to the moon um, because I think moon will become that cheap and Euro Disney may become that expensive. I was going to say, as we see this program increasingly unfold, what will this mission, in your point of view, bring to mankind? We haven't left low Earth orbit since 1972. I mean, that's, that point is just so amazing to me. Apollo 17 was the last time that we had people leave low Earth orbit. And, you know, we talk about uh, all the stuff that goes on on our planet. And, you know, there's more people and, and things change. I mean, it's so many people, whether it's, you know, astronauts or theorists or futurists saying, we really don't want to be just a single planet species you know at some point will there be some sort of you know cosmic event uh, that'll, that'll cause earth to be uninhabited and if that ever were to come to fruition you know thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years in the future do we want to be able to have someplace else that we've already figured out how to go to uh do we want to be able to you know as interesting as exploring is why did you know europeans cross the atlantic ocean to, to go explore you know the, the new world um, you know why why did we want to leave earth to go to you know look at the moon and the short durations of the apollo missions you know we we barely scratched the surface of of knowing what the moon is like and it's a history book of what's happened to earth simply because earth we have all this you know wind and water erosion and things change we don't have that on the moon it's, it's just a textbook of, of what's happened to the figure what's happened to the earth's probably happened to the moon as well and so we got a lot to learn about our planet by going to the other planet in our uh you know the other heavenly body closest to us and then eventually that leads to hey going out to our nearest uh you know closest sister-like planet of mars you know where we're sending out the the new uh, perseverance um uh probe going out next year you know, with, with the first time we're going to fly a helicopter on another planet, you know, with Mar in Mars's thin atmosphere. I mean, and that's all precursors to be able to send humans there eventually, you know, in the 2030s. And certainly a, another mission, just like the, the lunar stuff, it, it, with the, the gateways and international partnership moving from low Earth orbit to, to lunar orbit. Well, no doubt that the Mars mission is going to be an international partnership as well, because, you know, no one country can afford to do that themselves. It's a us as humans from our planet Earth here that we're going to send out a human mission to Mars. You mentioned it earlier. Um, we at Airbus, we're a proud contributor to the to the um, Orion uh, spacecraft program via the European Space Agency with our European service module, and uh, which makes this whole endeavor, uh, I would say, you know, like a transatlantic partnership. And you've been involved in this. I mean, for, for quite a while. How would you describe the collaboration between Americans and Europeans on the Orion spacecraft project? It's been awesome to see. I mean, I, I got started with you guys during ATV. Uh, I was a brand new astronaut and I got signed as the astronaut, you know, to bring uh, ATV, uh, the final phase of ATV-1 to flight. And so we were figuring out, okay, how's this thing going to fly? What's the interior going to be set up like? How, what are the crew procedures going to be once it docks to the space station? And a lot of time spent on 
okay, this is an unmanned vehicle docking to the ISS. How are we going to monitor it to make sure it's doing what it's, what it's supposed to do and the systems prove what they uh, uh, that they are actually you know accurate and that we don't end up with uh, with a, a unmanned vehicle coming to the the space station causing a problem. And so that was a lot of the effort to get for ATV one and. Look at us now, we're already complete with the ATV program. But ATV led the way to the service module basic design. And that, uh, you know, took that technology and is now adapted to the point where we're going to have the European service module take the Orion space capsule, you know, out beyond low Earth orbit together. You know, we're within L minus 12 months for Artemis 1. So that first service module is going to leave low Earth orbit next year and do this fly around mission of the moon, proving out all the you know, propulsion systems, navigation systems. Uh, it's going to go ahead and have a lot of the spacecraft uh, hull, uh, cameras and all types of other things we're going to have inside, as well as the, the number one priority uh, test point is getting up to lunar return velocities and testing out the new heat shield. And so together, the service module is going to be with there with Orion throughout the whole duration of the Artemis 1 flight, right, until we come back and uh, uh, separate to be able to get to the uh, entry to the atmosphere. And then, you know, in the spring of 2023, Artemis 2, and are going to take the same combination with a Orion capsule, European service module, and put crew on it. And that'll be the first time the crew will fly on Orion, first time the crew will fly with the European service module, first time crew will fly on the SLS rocket, the largest rocket that humans will have ever built. And that mission will be a combination of checking out Orion for the first time, like Apollo 7 did, as well as going around the moon for the first time, like Apollo 8. So it's a combination of Apollo 7 and 8 in one mission. And so that's going to be a really exciting time. And then Artemis 3, that's going to be the Apollo you know, 9, 10, and 11 all combined in one mission where Artemis 3, European Service Module 3, SLS 3 will leave, take that crew with Orion to a lunar orbit and rendezvous with either the Gateway Space Station or the uh, lander, the HLS lander direct, the human landing system lander from one of the three companies that we're working with right now. And then two of the crew are going to get off Orion and go down to the lunar surface, putting the first woman and the next man on the moon. That's going to be 2024. And that's just amazing, amazingly aggressive timeline, uh, you know, but it is great to see everybody working like crazy to try and make that happen. Far better than, you know, having ministerials and talk, you know, in some random sense about, well, we'll go to the moon someday, we'll go to Mars someday. No, let's put a date on it and try to beat it. And uh, that's, it's neat to see how quickly the teams have galvanized and really gotten moving and working together to make that happen. And certainly the European service module is a big part of that. And for the gateway, you know, having the IHAB and the Esprit, um, that's, you know, that was what makes gateway work. So really the last 20 years together in low Earth orbit is now moving to lunar orbit and, and moving that partnership uh, out, out farther into the uh, into the solar system. My last question is probably just a rather rhetorical one because I think you just answered it. Somebody like you, you know, who's had such a successful career in military aviation, who's been up to space twice, has done spacewalks, has probably seen it all. What keeps you going? What gets you up in the morning? And what is it that you still want to achieve? I've always wanted to fly and, and, and I, you know, made the choice and was fortunate to be selected as a test pilot because it, it's always interesting to me on making new things. And so, you know, working on ATV and HTV for their first flights, um, being able to work on, you know, for me flying a shuttle for the first time, flying on Soyuz for the first time, do spacewalks for the first time. And now in the past two years where I've been the, the, the branch chief for our exploration branch within the astronaut office, working on Orion and the SLS and our ground systems, working on the new lunar space suit and the uh, human landing system landers that you know, we just announced three companies in April. We're working to see which one of those companies we want to actually down select to to actually build the lunar lander. And then uh, certainly Gateway. I mean, a new whole new space station in lunar orbit, you know, that's what fuels me. It is doing the stuff that I read about as a kid that the icons of aviation and, and uh, space flight have done and having an opportunity to contribute to that so that someday, you know, whether it's, it's my kids or, or kids that are listening there over in Europe, you know, can go to a space simply because they want to, not because they had to choose it as a job. Um, because seeing our home planet from above it and going around it every 90 minutes or, you know, the Apollo astronauts that left low Earth orbit and were able to put their thumb out and cover up the whole Earth. To be able to see that changes you as a person. You, you realize that I, it's not just me and, and I, I don't go looking for my hometown or my home state or my home country or anymore. It is, I am part of a human race and we all exist on this little, you know, blue, beautiful blue marble together. And anything I can do to further that and make it so more people can see it from that perspective and be changed and touched in their soul, then that's, you know, certainly uh, worth getting up every morning. And I can share a final thought. For those of you that have not been to space yet, if you Google NASA Sound of Silence, my Italian crewmate, Paolo Nespoli, and my Russian crewmate, Sergei Rozanski, the three of us took pictures and videos from space and got permission to put it to a very recognizable song called Sound of Silence. And 
the part that you miss when you see videos and pictures from space is the emotional aspect and that part about you know being a human detached from your planet but going around it every 90 minutes and then realizing that everything that has ever happened in human history everybody you you've ever known in your lifetime you just went around in 90 minutes and it makes you very humble and feel very small uh, i'm very fortunate to see it from that perspective and so with the pictures and video combined with the the music hopefully uh we've said pe people have told us that it really gives them the emotional response of what it's like to see earth from that perspective until you get a chance there to do it yourself so i recommend you guys do that put on the big screen turn up the volume and enjoy what it's like to see your home planet from the astronauts perspective awesome we'll do exactly that thanks so much for having been with us uh, today really comrade from all of us here all the best to you and all the best for your future endeavors at NASA. And hopefully in a few years down the road, uh, we can chat again, maybe on this program and talk about your moon landing. Sounds great, Martin. I appreciate uh, talking with you all. It, it's very fortunate for the partnership and the, all the opportunities I've gotten to go over there and work with uh, ESA and, and all the folks that, uh, you know, ESA, um, you know, is able to use like Airbus to, you know, bring space flight to, to fruition. And uh, I look forward to you guys being along for the ride next year with Artemis One. We can all watch in amazement that the work we've done uh, is getting us closer to humans leaving low Earth orbit and getting back on the moon. And that's a wrap for this edition of We Make It Fly, the Airbus podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Tell us what you think about this episode. We'd love to have your feedback. You can follow us all on social media and simply use the hashtag WeMakeItFly to get in touch with us. Thanks for listening and until next time.